Yes, we were recording. So we saw monochromatic plane waves. Uh, they, the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, and they are perpendicular to the direction of motion. We saw that the electric field and magnetic field, again, in empty space, are in phase. Um, and we saw how to write this in, in uh, not just propagating the z direction, but in an arbitrary direction. Um, so today, what we're going to look at is some more properties of electromagnetic waves, uh, and then look at them again, revisit them again in matter. Um, and then uh, the next step from there is what happens when you go from one medium to another, so at the interface between two different types of, of media. Right? And again, what we're doing is we're heading towards uh, optics, right? What happens when electromagnetic waves uh, go from one medium to another? Uh, how do they change? Um, so we're going to start off, though, that with the fact that uh, taking a look, whoops, wrong tool, pardon me. The fact that our electromagnetic waves um, I'm going to say they carry energy and momentum. We saw that there were energy and momentum associated with the fields, um, but now we know that our waves propagate from one direction to another. Okay, it's not necessarily obvious, but but you can, it, it is plausible that as they propagate along, they're carrying their energy and their momentum along. And so we're going to explicitly take a look at that. So, so to begin with, a right, quick reminder, including for the quiz, right? We have an expression for energy density. Um, and this is our lowercase u because it is a symbol that we've been using for energy density, not the total energy. And it depends on the fields quadratically. So let's go ahead and uh, we can start to plug in for our fields as we know them for our monochromatic uh, plane waves. So again, plane waves. Right, we saw that there's a specific relationship between um, our magnetic field and our electric field. So our magnetic field was just, in terms of its magnitude at least, was just 1 over C times the electric field. So the magnetic field squared will be 1 over C squared times the electric field squared. And we also know that C squared is 1, I'm sorry, we know that C is 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught, right? So we can write 1 over C squared is mu naught epsilon naught. Right, again. Okay, so let's update our expression for the energy density then. So we've got the one half epsilon naught e squared, and then when I plug in 1 over mu naught times b squared, well, the mu naughts cancel it out, and I get another epsilon naught e squared right there, which we can now collect, right? The Those two terms add up to 2, then cancel out the 1 half, so we just get epsilon naught e squared, right? And this is our electric field, and so now we can actually just plug in our expression for the electric field uh, in our plane wave. And, and just to keep it simple, let's take a look at a plane wave going in the z direction. We know how to generalize that to arbitrary direction. So what we have is the amplitude uh, times the cosine of the kz minus omega t plus delta term. And then we're squaring the electric field, so I got to square both that amplitude and the cosine. So what see is this cosine is also moving along to the right to, to, to higher z's. So yeah, the wave carries energy density. It 
It's going propagating. This energy is propagating along with the wave. Okay. Um, let's do. Let's take a look at. All right, so we just look and we see that, okay, this expression for the energy is sliding along off to the right. Can we see how much energy per unit time per unit area is transported? All right, so. So how much is getting carried along like that? Um, so we've got a way to figure that out, right? We have a quantity that tells us exactly that. Pointing, not kind of pointing, Mr. Pointing Vector. I'm going to start calling it Mr. Pointing Vector from now on, right? Um, <laughs> Right, so we can put all that in. So let's do just for example, um, let's do, we already have a wave going in the Z direction. Let's pick E in the X direction and B in the Y directions so that S points in the Z direction. Um, it, we could do other versions of that too. So this becomes E naught cosine of that propagating phase and we'll have that rise in the x hat direction again that's arbitrary and then for our b field right we know actually it's the exact same thing except it's got to be perpendicular and the magnitude is one over c is large Okay, so we've got that, um, and all right, so we've got E naught squared, we've got a C, one over C. Um, so here, let's write a, this a couple of ways, right? We've got uh, one over mu naught C, and an E naught squared, and cosine squared. And that's in the z hat direction. And if we take a look at um, this one over um, mu naught c here, let me just make an aside before I write before we clean this up a little bit. I'm going to write off to the right here. Um, one over mu naught c right is going to be equal to well c is one over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. So this is square root of mu naught epsilon naught like that, all that over mu naught. And so, for example, then we've got actually the square root of mu naught cancels one of the square roots of mu naught in the bottom. So we got root mu naught down there, root epsilon naught up here. And then um, one of the things we can do is we can, here, I'll just rewrite that exact same expression and multiply by one. What one am I going to choose? I'm going to choose square root of epsilon naught over square root of epsilon naught. And so notice what I've got up top is I've got epsilon naught over mu naught epsilon naught under the square root, right? And that one over mu naught epsilon naught is C. So this becomes epsilon naught C, right? So we're going to use that back in our expression right here. Um, so our one over mu naught c is the same as epsilon naught c. We're going to do this just to clean it up a little bit, make it look a little bit nicer. So this is epsilon naught times c. Oh, but wait a second. If we look at this, this expression that we've just written right here, right, that is 
if we take out the C, that is exactly equal to our energy density right here. So it's C times the energy density and also it's in vector form heading in the Z direction. So I'm just gonna rewrite this right here. C, why? Cause. Um, so <laughs> what we're saying is our energy density is moving along at Z. I don't, yeah, it's so bad that Nate left, apparently. Cool. All right, so we can, we've done a bunch of calculations, seen that there's energy associated with the wave, and we saw that it's propagating, and specifically we see now that we can think of it as like a, the energy density in a certain region right here is traveling along at C, just like the waves are. Cool. I'm going to quickly uh, save a snapshot of this. I say quickly because it's. I'm going to try to be quick because it actually is slower than I wish it were. Okay, cool. Okay, so that was the wave carrying the energy. We mentioned also they carry momentum. So let's take a look at that. Um, so we have an expression for that, our momentum. Again, I'm gonna try to use a cursive lowercase p to distinguish it from all the other P's we have. Uh, cool. Windows, yeah, it, it's it's more the saving that's the, the slow part, but thank you. That is useful. Um, so our momentum is going to point in the same direction as the pointing vector. And we did this earlier on in chapter eight. Right, it's going to have something to do with a pointing vector. It's like that. So let's actually just stick that in here. So we just calculated what S was. For our, Again, remember, this is just for our plane wave. Not true just in general, but for this specific case. Um, so we've got... all the stuff that we had before. Uh, and we said that that the uh, pointing vector was C times U uh, in the Z hat direction. So dividing that by one over C squared gives us one over C times the energy density in the Z hat direction. And again, I didn't forget the c squared in the first over here. This is, it was one over c squared times c epsilon naught. So one of the factors of c cancels out there. All right, so cool. We've got this, all these expression for the momentum and the energy. And we see for all of them that uh, we're, that if you look, we, we get something that um, it's the cosine, it's proportional to, the cosine squared. Um, so if we look at that cosine squared, right, what that's doing is that's going from zero up to a maximum value of sine squared hits one, um, down to zero, back up to one, down to zero, back up to one. So we kind of have areas of uh, high in, high energy density, low energy density, high energy density, low energy density, and they're moving along like this. Same thing, momentum. You've got high momentum density. Um, low zero momentum density, high momentum density, low zero momentum density, and they move off to the right. And again, so this is what I said momentum, right? This is momentum density. 
right? Which is the momentum per unit volume, right? And if you added up the field, the contributions of the momentums in a box, uh, of the fields in a box, you know, you would get the total momentum for that volume. Um, so the problem is we've got this, you know, if we're talking about, um, you know, high density, low zero, high density, zero, there, if we're talking about like visible light, right, that's alternating, cosine squared is has a, a period of half of the cosine, so it's going to be a period half a wavelength, so a nanometer scale, or another way to say this, is if we sat at one spot and watched this go by us, like, do, 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 right, my fingers going past like that, uh, the camera, um, we're going to see it going, you know, maximum zero, maximum zero, maximum zero, alternating really, really quickly, um, in particular, right, so for, so for visible light, we've got, a, you know, our frequency is about, right, 10 to the 15 hertz, right, and the wavelength is about 500 nanometers, right? So very small, very fast. So if we conduct a measurement, it's going to involve many, many cycles. So, I mean, let's just, so what we're going to do is you end up with is kind of an average. Because sometimes it's high, sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's zero. Right? And so let's make a plot of this right here. So this could be U or P right here. And similarly, we could have Z or T on this axis. And what we're seeing is something that does this, but really quickly from zero up to a maximum. And that's supposed to be the same height all the way across. So, right, if this was, if we were just looking at cosine squared, forgetting about all the coefficients out front, that maximum is one. And so the average value right there, right, is, it's not obvious what the average would be, right? You might expect it to be one half, but maybe it spends more time up near one, or maybe it spends more time down by zero. Um, it turns out, indeed, it is one half. And one way to uh, take a look at that is what are we actually um, adding up? If we take the average, right, we integrate, then divide by the the uh, the total uh, interval. So the integral is going to be everything uh, underneath the curve. Yes, it's hard to do. If I could change my pen tip, I would make it fatter and fill it in easy, more easily. But that's not an option here in Blackboard. Uh, so one of the things we can do, though, is let's take a look just at, for example, uh, this part right here in, in the second, the first full bump. Can you see that in yellow? I just colored it in yellow. Let's take this piece right here and we can use it and we can fill in the gap, the valley right next to it. And once we do that, then we see that we get a, you know, a, a basically a constant, a rectangle that is one half high, right? It's halfway up to, to one. So, okay, the way we can write this in set of kind of geometry, geometry arguments is we're taking the average of cosine squared, and I'll just call it x. x isn't necessarily a position. It's whatever the argument is. And so uh, here, these triangle brackets, they're going to mean an average over an interval. So how do we actually calculate this? So we go from, take an integral from zero to t of that cosine squared, but then we divide by t long, right? It's kind of like adding up, if they were discrete, we could add up t copies and then divide by the number of copies, divide by t. So we, 
but in this case, we're integrating instead of adding because it's a continuous function. And remember, omega, so if we're doing this temporally, omega is 2 pi over t. And so I did this here for one period. We see that the average of cosine squared over one period is equal to one half. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll be this will be coming kind of late, but here I'll throw an extra credit onto heck, I'll throw into the exam. I'll add it to the exam. I'll happy with that. You can always use extra credit. What we're going to do is we're going to show that the average of cosine squared um is about equal to about equal to one half um no yeah I, I will post the problem um if you don't see it in the next 24 hours remind me but i will try i, I will set myself a note to remember it so even so if we do lots of cycles this average is going to be one half um, whoops, even if it's not an integer number of periods. So um, specifically here, this is what I'm going to be asking you to do. I want to see that the limit, uh, if we go, t goes to infinity of the average of cosine squared x, where x is that kz minus omega t plus delta. So the limit is equal to 1 half, right? And when you're talking about 10 to the 15 cycles in a second, if you do a measurement that's a second long, half a second long, 10 to the 15, eh, physics-wise, that's pretty close to infinity, right? Again, the one, two, a bunch, infinity, is kind of the way we count. All right, so we're setting this up right here. Um, here, I'm going to see... I'm just going to separate that off, and we're, I'm going to continue up above, up here. So we take that result, and we can plug it back in for our expression for u, right, <laughs> which was had the cosine squared in it. So if we take the average of our energy density, we get a factor of 1 half times the epsilon naught e naught squared, right? We don't have to take the cosine squared term, what we just do is we take the prefactor of one half. Same thing for our pointing vector. Right. So it's that same expression, whoops, times C. C U in the Z hat direction. Right. We can plug in you can now actually, you don't have to go back to the previous slide. You can look off to the left and get our expression for the average momentum density. And so we've got that right there. Cool. Let's actually take a little bit closer look um, at, at 
one of these expressions right here. Um, we can measure the total energy incident on our measuring instrument. So maybe it's got some area right there, like this. Um, but more often what we're doing is we're measuring the energy per unit time. Are those equations worth boxing in your notes? Sure, yeah, those are worth boxing. I'll do it for you. For the recording, but box it in your own notes too. Those are worth doing. Um, this next one's almost as, in, is as important. We usually don't measure the pointing vector directly. Um, usually we measure some scalar version of this. Um, Right, so the magnitude of S um, right there <laughs> is, so here the, uh, give me one second. I don't like what I was saying. It's the energy per unit area. Uh, let's call it energy per unit time per unit area. It doesn't matter which order we do that division. <laughs> That's supposed to be per unit time. Oh, gosh. I'm not making it any better. Per unit area, right? But it also has with the direction that it's going. So we, our instruments typically don't have a directionality. And we also have another name for energy per unit time there. That's power. Right. So here, if we measure just power and we don't worry about the um, um, we don't worry about the directionality. So here, I'll do energy per unit time. Right, that's, that's power. So power per unit area, we have another name for that, is intensity. Um, so another way to say this is our intensity, we can define it, hence the three bars. It's the average of the magnitude of the pointing vector. And then we can just look up above, find out what that is. So this is supposed to be a triangular bracket, but it's getting, that doesn't look right. It's getting rounded off by this triangle. It is windy outside. Oh. This one's also uh, worth retaining, this idea of intensity. So the intensity of our electromagnetic wave, let's say, let's say it's light. The intensity of the light um, is just proportional to the magnitude of the electric field squared. It's specifically one half C epsilon naught uh, E naught squared. And that's actually not too bad to remember. Um, so here's a question. So light hitting a surface delivers momentum to the surface. That's the, the th upper box. That's the third expression, right? What's going to absorb more, which one is going to receive more m momentum from light? If you have an absorber, like a black sheet versus a mirror. Harry says a mirror. How about someone else? What do you say? Uh, who was that? Definitely the mirror. All right, Derek, why are you saying the mirror? Um, because if I understand 
right? The mirror reflects all the light. Uh -huh. So if I'm thinking about like if you throw a ball at a non-moving wall, the wall has to impart the same force the ball put at it back out to okay. change the direction of the ball. Whereas if the wall was moving and the ball was going at it, it would kind of just like not the force would be less because the wall is also moving. Ooh, okay. Um, that makes that, that's just how I thought about it. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm actually going to go a little bit, I'm, I like the ball analogy, right? That, that it's a lot easier to think of the momentum carried by a ball than by um, uh, uh, a wave. Um, I, I'm going to not go with a moving wall as the contrast, though, right? So let's just look at the ball by itself. Um, and um, actually, give me one moment to try this whole snip thing. All right, draw a shape, because I'm going to move to a different screen, too. OK, that's fine, but that didn't give me the option to save. Oh, all right, this is a different way to do it. I tried Harry's keystroke shortcut, and it's not, it's fine. It's just not necessarily any more straightforward on the back end. Ah, cool, one moment. Um, I'm not particularly good at multitasking. Yep. Um, and I, I lost the first part of the, the other one. We'll see. Oh, I know what I did last time. Okay. Uh, no. All right. Oh, wrong button. I'm really sorry, folks. Give me a moment. I'm still learning new things. Apparently, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Who the what? It's snowing. You're up in like Harford County. It's up, up north. That's crazy. Yeah. It's been super windy, and I know there's like. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah, we're all over the place. Uh, Pennsylvania. Cool. Um, here. All right. So So we hit the absorber versus the mirror, right? So for the absorber, right, what happens, you've got the wave with momentum P, right? Or you could say, let's, we could look at one part of it and say momentum density P, the wave's going along and then the wave is gone if it gets absorbed. So obviously P, you've got an idea you want to suggest? Yeah. Um... Yeah. Uh, if you drop a ball onto concrete yeah. versus if you drop it onto grass. Yeah, I like it. So keep going. I mean, that that was just the instead of the moving wall. I, the yeah, grass. right, right. So 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 something. So you know, and and um, I think Derek, you're the only one who had me for the for for um uh first semester physics. Um, I do an example in the class where I do a rubber ball off of a, a surface. Like, you know, as I talk about throwing either uh, a lump of clay, so it goes thump and just sticks to the surface, or a rubber ball and it bounces off the surface. And so what's the change 
for for the, so for the clay, it just sticks to the surface. In this case, the light gets absorbed. Um, for the rubber ball or for the mirror, right? You've got P going that way and P going the other way. So what is the net change? Is two P, right? It's P to the left minus a P to the right is the change, right? And so P to the right is negative P to the left. So P minus a minus P gives us two P. Um, and so if we've got a change in momentum, right, we know that um, that's going to exert a pressure. As time passes. So in this case, it's we can call this radiation pressure. What is a pressure? Yeah. Good question, Nick. A type of force? It's related to force. It's proportional here. It's going to be the force per unit area. Right? So you can take the same force. So what's the difference between pushing with the palm of your hand and pushing with the tip of a knife? If you push with the exact same force, which one's going to cause more damage to a person's skin, right? It's the knife because the knife is exerting a much greater pressure. It's the same force divided by a tiny, tiny area. So it's a very, very large pressure, right? Don't understand the power of my hand. That turned, yeah, I know, I know. Um, we could come up with better, with happier analogies. But yeah, let's take a look at this radiation pressure. So again, let's do pressure is going to be the force per unit area, right? And another way to write the force is, so I'll leave the one over area. Force is quarantine. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Right? So our force is dp dt. So it's a change of momentum in a certain amount of time. Um, and so um, let's do this for our, um, just for an absorber, right? So this is going to be uh, 1 over A. Our delta P right here is going to be whatever our average momentum density is per unit area. And then how, so that, so momentum density is going to be the momentum per volume. And so we can take a cross-sectional area, and then we have to get the third dimension to get the volume. Well, so how much goes by in a certain, that's a, that is, um, here, I'll clean that up for you. That's a little bit ugly right there. That is, here, I'll fix the P too. This is. So that's my momentum density, and that's supposed to be my average right there, right? Um, so I'm going to keep going with this. I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me know when there's, there's mistakes like that. I'm glad it doesn't happen when we're in person that just your hand appears on the board next to where I'm writing. But um, in this case, that's a perfect way to do it. <laughs> um, so here, I'm going to draw just a, here a little box, right? Our momentum. Um, so this, so, oh, here's one difference right here. So um, this P right here is the momentum. This is supposed to be a cursive P, so it's the momentum density, the momentum per unit volume. Again, so uh, P script cursive P is equal to P divided by the volume. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's it's. I I know the the different font, or different style P's and rows were confusing when I was writing like with, with chalk or pencil, and it's all the more difficult in this format. Grr, I know, I know. Don't hate the player. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to, let's imagine this is the wave is traveling along this way, right? And so we're going to look at this right here. And 
this side right here is going to have area A. And so this length um, on the, sorry, this length right here. Um, well, we're looking at a certain interval of time. So how much volume of wave actually strikes, what length of the wave strikes it in, in that delta T? That length right there is going to be, well, is moving at C. So C delta T worth of wave will impact the surface. So this becomes the delta P. So I'm going to say delta P is equal to the average momentum density times, oops, uh, I want that to be AC delta T, A times C delta T. Again, the A is for the, the area that is that the wave is hitting, and C delta T is the length of wave that is going to hit the surface in that amount of time. And then right here, we're dividing by delta T still from before. So notice the A and the delta T go away, which is good because we're, we, don't, we weren't talking specifically about a particular area in a particular time. So that shouldn't actually enter into it. Um, so we're left with just the average momentum density times C, which we can write out right here. Uh, that cancels the 1 over C. We're left 1 over epsilon naught, E naught squared. Um, which, if you remember, actually going back, right, this was equal to I over C. So again, our radiation pressure P is equal to the intensity of the light divided by C. Um, so we've that ex so so we've kind of just strung together a bunch of relationships right here, um, and uh, you know and concluded that okay our waves carry energy they carry um, momentum um, and when they strike a surface they're going to uh, exert a pressure on it, but how does it actually work? Like how does having an electromagnetic wave exert a pressure? Um, so here's something that the, the textbook doesn't really talk about that very, very much. So um, I want to actually just take a look at this. Um, uh, yeah, draw out a picture so we can see the mechanism for this. So let's start off actually just with our coordinate axes to begin with. So we're going to have our wave going in the z direction right here, oh, z direction. So in before, right, we arbitrarily just kind of to have something specific to talk about. Ah, I don't know. I didn't. I jumped ahead of myself. We picked the electric field to be in the x direction, right? So that's the x direction. Yes. Oh, well, so the radiometer, um, give, give me one second, uh, Nick. Um, by the radiometer, are you talking about those kind of like light bulb shaped things like this? That's got like the vein inside. Um, yeah, black and white. And um, let me come back to that. If I, if I forget to, um, I, the, I will, um, if I forget to come back to it, please remind me. Because you would think it would be, but it's not. And I'll come back to it, like I said. So um, what's going on in our situation right here, right? We've got um, our electric field pointing this way. We've got our magnetic field. Again, this is supposed to be a perspective drawing, right? Really, it's coming uh, out of the screen is where our magnetic field is pointing, and they're propagating along in that direction. That's an S, because the pointing vector shows the direction it's going. It could also be the K hat. Um, and so we're going to see, well, what happens when it hits a surface right here? And I think I wanted to make it bigger, but eh. 
who cares? So let's imagine the surface charges can move. Um, it could be that it's a dielectric, and so we just get a little bit of stretching. It could be that it's a, 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 a conductor, but maybe not an uh, ideal conductor, so that they can move a little bit more freely. What happens to the charges when this wave strikes this thing? What's the first thing that happens? Imagine they're positive charges. So here, I'll put a little Q right there. What happens? It's just a sheet. They're stuck inside the sheet. What happens to that charge Q, which is positive? Spins in a circle. No, it doesn't spin in a circle. Electric field, right? Here's my hint. Let's look at the electric field first. What does this electric field do to this charge Q? Electric field pushes the charge, pushes it if Q is positive. Yeah, F equals QE, so it pushes it upwards. So what we're going to get here, let's change colors, is that charge right there starts moving up. V, so one. Okay. And which way does the magnetic field push the charge next? Hmm. You should be getting interested in one of your hands. Yeah, so the no, not the left hand. You're just messing with me now, right? So we've got the force is here. Well, I'll write it out, right? The force from the magnetic field is Q V and V was up cross B. So up cross V, while well, V is out for, for you folks, right, is, uh, I mean, up cross B, uh, B is coming out of the screen, right? So up cross out of the screen gives you something going to the right. Right, it's pushing in the Z hat direction. Okay, so that's a that's as the wave first hits, and then a little while later, right, the electric field has reversed direction. Ah, all right. So, because you want to say, well, why isn't it pushing the the whole thing upwards, right? Later, E and B are reversed. Right, so E points down. Whoops, supposed to be pushes Q down. Which way does B push it? If B is now pointing into the page or into the screen. to the right still, right? Because in what's happened is same direction, V has changed direction and B has changed direction. So a negative and a negative, as at least compared to previously, produces the same direction, right? That's supposed to say still along, right? So we can see now kind of at this microscopic scale, the origin of radiation pressure. Actually look at the individual charges as they get pushed around. So they're getting pushed up and down, so that averages out to zero, but they're always getting pushed 
off to the right here, radiation pressure. Cool. Um, Okay, so we've got 15 minutes. I want to wrap up with Maxwell's equations at an interface, um, not an interface, in matter. We're not going to get to an, an interface between two different types of matter. Um, so let's just, let's just set up for next class. So this is a bit of a departure. We looked at the energy momentum carried and imparted by the field. Um, let's look at matter. Oh, radiometer, thank you, Nick. Um, so you would think. Right, that what's the difference between black and white on the on this radiometer? So I hope folks know what I'm uh, talking about. Um, reflectivity, right? The white is like the equivalent of the mirror, right? Black is the equivalent of the absorber. So the um, so you would think that what's happening here? I'll draw a top-ish view. So here, uh, pardon me. I have to. Yes, I've got one. Right, and the rate of spin depends on how sunny it is. The more sunny it is, the faster it spins. So radiometer, right? So top view, right? So it's that light bulb looking thing, and with top view sort of. Yeah, I've got one in my office. Albedo, right, albedo is another name for how uh, whether it, the you absorb or ref, uh, reflect the light is it you know is it dark or is it uh, light colored surface? If it's light colored, it means the light striking it reflects back off and goes to your eye. Um, so here, here's the radiometer. Here's the white part right here. Here's if we look at it, you know we're seeing a, kind of the left hand side of this. So this one. We see the white on that side. This one right here right, is going to be dark. And then this one right here, since we're now uh, seeing kind of the right side, because this is not quite dead on. Right? So, it's, so every, every one of these has a light side and a dark side. right? Um, and they're all, like, if you look at it as it spins clockwise, yeah, yeah. Ever heard of albedo? Yeah, um, you can Google that on the side. Albedo. Um, we use it when we're talking about like, hey, you know, the the fact that the polar ice caps melt, for example, um, as they melt, the Earth will absorb even more energy because instead of being a white surface, it'll be dark blue of water, um, and so. Um, the, the sunlight that falls on it won't just be reflected, you know, not as much will be reflected back out into space. It will, more of it will be absorbed by the, the water and hence the earth. And so that is a way that we start to get runaway change. Yes, talk about this all getting dark. Yep, indeed. So we saw right here that the waves on this side, right, we're going to get a push of p suppose there's the same amount of sunlight in all directions so on this side though right here right because this side's white it's a reflector we saw that there's a change of two times p right because the light comes in and it bounces off so you get a push of 2p per unit time that way and same thing um i've got this drawn wrong wait oh this is the left side Crud. I, I've got this. Yeah. I've. This is a stupid perspective. Um, <laughs> I've got the, them. That's right. This side has to be white. This side. Wait. This is the white side here. I've got this backwards. We take that scribble and we're going to take these things away. That's the white side. That's the white side. White. This is the black side, the way I've drawn it. It's over here. Right. So on this side, right, we've got 2P. 
and you get a push of just P there. On this side, you get a push of 2P and a push of just P there. On this side, it's just P, and on this side, it's 2P. And on this side, it's just P, and on this side, it's 2P. Where P is, yeah, the momentum per unit time. Um, in a, or I'm sorry, momentum in a certain amount of time, right? So that's in, in you know, a microsecond. That's how much momentum of light, uh, how much momentum is being imparted by um, the light, right? Or another way, we could actually use the capital P for pressure. Yeah. To, uh, Top P, I think, is flipped. Because wouldn't it be like trying to break itself apart? Uh, you're right. The top one is flipped, indeed. I, I, I seem to be having trouble drawing. That's my problem. Right, this side has to be white the way we're viewing it. Um, so this side right here is, whoops, my 2P. And this is the shorter one. So which way is the light pressure trying to spin this thing? Is it, it's trying to spin it clockwise, right? So here, let's put this. Yes, like that, right? Okay, here's the annoying thing. So the light pressure is going to torque it like that. <laughs> um, which way does the thing actually spin? You put it in the sunlight. Oh, well, why is he asking a question like this? Is it spins this way? What? So that's the actual direction that it spins. Opposite what the radiation pressure is doing to it. So the radiation pressure, it really still is pushing it that way, but the radiation pressure isn't what makes it move. Um, we'll do eventually. We'll do um, some some uh, homework problems where we actually calculate the radiation pressure, and it's tiny. It's going to be tiny even compared to these things that weigh you know a few grams or or, or whatever. Why is it opposite? Yeah. So first of all, I'm going to let's say first it's tiny compared to a macroscopic thing over over a short period of time of seconds or a minute or something like that. If you make a really really big thing like the solar sails that, that you researched in the warm up, and you just wait a long long time, months and months and months, then that delta p you can eventually add up and give you some velocity, and you can push your spaceship outwards in the, you know, heading towards the outer reaches of the solar system using a solar sail. But you just have to, the acceleration is going to be small. You just have to wait for the velocity to gradually, gradually, gradually change. And it, but it keeps at it, keeps at it, right? Um, the other way you can make it be appreciable is have a relatively small change of momentum, but have a really, really tiny mass that you're applying it to. And so we can actually use light to exert forces on um, on atoms, for example, right? It's a small change of momentum that we're, we're imparting to the atom, but the atom is tiny. So that's actually an appreciable change in velocity. This is the idea behind uh, laser cooling and some of the manipulation of atoms that we can do with light. Some of the stuff that I, I work on um, and that, that the lab that Harry uh, works in, they work on. Um, so I still have an answer to the question. Why does it turn the way it actually turns? And so that is not due to electric, uh, electricity and magnetism, the, like we've been talking about. It's due to really thermodynamics. Um, there's another effect going on. So this thing here is held in this glass bulb. And you might think that it's held there because, um, yeah, you might think that it's held there in the glass bulb because it's under vacuum. And it's it's it could be under you know an okay vacuum, but it, but mostly it's just to prevent it to to protect it from you know air currents. Uh, so there's actually gas in there, and what happens is when the light hits the two sides, right, the black side warms up more, like Derek said, right, because it's absorbing the light and the light carries energy, 
so that energy turns into thermal energy, black side warms up more. And so there is, yeah, because it's warmer, right, gas that's either embedded on it comes off of it because it's hot, or anything that hits it then comes off extra fast because it's warmer there. So what you've got is from the black side, you actually have jets of gas coming out on the black side or bigger jets than on the other side. So these are the gas coming off. So what does that do if there's gas shooting off of this side? Then that pushes this side this way. Ah, so Ian M says it should be spinning one way, but that's actually a very relatively small force. It's the force of it, the outgassing, or even just the, the gas hitting and coming off extra warm. Uh, that is enough to overpower the radiation pressure and make it spin actually the other way. Oh. Okay. What if it was in vacuum? Yeah, that's cool, except that it's when it's warm is what makes it move. Um, ha, 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 ha. Um, what about if it was in vacuum? If it was in perfect vacuum, yes, only radiation pressure, eh, except, except actually, uh, Nick, um, Part of it is, so a perfect vacuum is actually somewhat hard to obtain because, right, we've got this, these veins that are painted black and the black paint or the fact that they were just, you know, they've got, they're, they're made out of metal. Um, the black paint oftentimes is made with some volatile organic compound. And so that outgasses and the warm side is going to, yeah, off gas even more. Um, than the cold side, or and it doesn't even doesn't even just have to be from the paint. Um, if it's just like a piece of metal, there's still going to be gaseous molecule. What sorry molecules of like nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, water um, embedded in the surface, and they'll slowly diffuse to the surface, and they'll leave at a larger velocity though, and actually at a slightly uh, you know, more often on the warm side than on the cold side. So you'll still have that happening. As time passed, if you've got something that's got an incredibly low vapor pressure, that's really a pure, pure metal, um, uh, you could you could minimize this. And so the and the other thing is um, being under uh, vacuum. There's still in this particular case, there's still the uh, friction at the pivot point. So we have to really, really suppress any off-gassing and not just the collisions with the, the air around it. Um, and we also have to make the friction small so that we can see the mi minuscule force uh, of the that results from the radiation pressure. But yeah, indeed, under the right, you know, if we minimize these other forces, then we could actually observe the radiation pressure. Yes, cool. Um, so, Oh, that's actually an interesting point. Um, th th so, um, oh, is that Derek, I think? Uh, oh, Harry. Um, exactly. All right, all right. So Harry asked, right, do the solar sails specifically not go through off-gassing before launch so you could use this principle to get the acceleration? Ask uh, Katie Ortiz, right, because that's what she's been testing at um, the Applied Physics Lab. Uh, she's been testing off-gassing of components. Um, uh, I, I have no idea. Like so, solar sails they've only been used in a few experimental setups. Um, they haven't been widely used for um, uh, uh, what call it for um, uh, propulsion. Um, th that said, um, I mean it's something that has to be taken into account. Um, there was something uh, the really. Yeah, because we're we're not going to actually talk about Maxwell's equations in in matter, um, uh, <laughs> and and the waves in matter. Um, we are going to. There was a. I'm trying to remember about 20 years ago uh, or so. Um, it was people were looking at the Voyager spacecrafts that were launched in the 70s, um, Voyager, uh, and they traveled out. You know, to the outer reaches of the solar system, where really, you know, they're far away from everything. The only thing exerting forces, uh, you know, a, a significant gravitational force on them, and it was small, um, was the sun. And so we knew how quickly they should be, 
decelerating and their deceleration as they as they're still moving away from the sun the sun's faintly tugging on them slowing them down um and their deceleration didn't match what was expected um and uh so people and it was just a small amount but it was different from you know the uncertainty and they could measure how quickly they were moving by by doppler shift in their radio signal um and people thought you know they went through all these possibilities and stuff like that and um they thought you know well maybe this is some um evidence that gravity isn't exactly one over r squared or maybe there's some additional force some fifth force or something going on um and it turned out it was that with like a whole bunch of research and testing similar parts and stuff like that it was likely just an ever so tiny tiny residual amount of off gassing due to the fact that some instruments were operating on one side and so there it was slightly warmer on one one side so that ever so slightly it was just the faintest like puff of gas but that was enough to to make it so that the um you know integrated over years and years and years it provided enough acceleration that it was measurable like i mean we were talking like I don't know, centimeters per like some large time squared. Cool. All right. So fun with physics. Um, let's stop here. Uh, make sure you do the quiz. Do the quiz. That's significant for the new car change. Yeah. <laughs> right. The new, new car smell. Does that slow you down or does it actually make you go faster? I guess the car feels zippy, so you go faster. Um, all that volatile off gassing. Now, I think that's a little more isotropic, though. Uh, all right, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, for my SMP, I need a new car, please. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> cool. I will see you folks on Monday. Don't forget the quiz and the reading. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. Oh, man. Um, yeah. Let me know if you want to talk about this. Can we get a physics department yeah, funding for the new car? Yeah. Oh, that's awful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can go on. You can talk right now for if you want to put on speaker i'm going to stop us recording though ah sorry <laughs> what was summer games what what do you mean by games What's that? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just got ready for that. Um, they had a program called Summer Games, um, which is basically they they take people um, into the program and they give them like some task that's like inspired by some client thing. So it's usually like something programming. Like they'll have you make an app or gotcha. work on something else. Yeah, but. I, I'm pretty bummed about that, and I'm now in the process of trying to figure out what I'm going to do this summer now that everything's been canceled and yeah, it doesn't yeah. seem like it's realistic to keep applying to things. So um, I, 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 I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. So um, one thing you might even look into is if there are any online tutoring like online instruction things because they're like those places are obviously hiring considerably um and you've got skills that are are, are in demand so that's one possibility but that, that that really sucks um my so i have a fellowship to work on base and that is that is possibly going on but they say we but without any but that that for now, telework isn't allowed because the whole point is to get in there and be working with people, um, and so that would potentially cancel it too. But you know, I, I, I've, you know, I've got my my full time job. Whereas for you for you folks, 
yeah, you you've got to get these internships. Um, yeah. So so my, so one. We should all keep looking or thinking around, and if, if folks have ideas, feel free to send them to me or actually even to Nick. But I would even consider looking into like something like tutoring or, or something like that, so, something through one of these online instruction platforms, or even just like, do they need help with coding and stuff like that? Um, there's still a lot of demand for those. Um, yeah. Um, I'll keep my eyes open too. All right, thank you. I'll get back to you with an update on how sure. things are going. But <laughs> a yeah. bit of a bummer, but uh, yeah, thank you, Harry. Yeah, it'll all work out. I'll, I'll just keep searching. If mm -hmm. nothing happens, then I'll I'll figure out something to make my time worthwhile. Sure thing. Sure. Um, all right. Yeah. Good luck, and, and yeah, uh, stay in touch, and I'll keep my eyes open too. All right. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. I'll all see. Right, Yep, see you later, Nick, and see everyone else too. I'm going to save this.